Linguistic confusions, buddy. Linguistic confusions. <laughs> All right. Man, I already made a video about this, but I feel so embarrassed about it. I, I don't think I did justice to Nietzsche's interesting thoughts from this essay called On Truth and Lies in a Non-Moral Sense. Plus, I think I'm getting the hand of this whole uh, YouTube thing right now. So I'm going to do it again. I swear, this time I'll do justice to it, all right? <laughs> Obviously, we're going to use the essay that he wrote called On Truth and Lies in a Non-Moral Sense to explain his thoughts. It's a lesser known piece of work by Nietzsche and highly un unappreciated. And it's honestly one of the most mind-blowing essays I have ever read. I have even included a link in the description for anyone that wants to read it. All right, look, uh, without further delay, let's get started. But please, like, remember, we are using the essay called On Truth and Lies in a Non-Moral Sense. Please don't lose track or forget that. People usually start floating away for after some time and then they get confused when their attention snap back to reality. Oh, there goes gravity. So try and keep that in mind. All right, man, let's get started. Nietzsche starts off with a quick story on how knowledge was created, where he states that this universe existed way before we came along with our intellect. It was us that invented this knowledge uh, and that even if mankind was to die out, there would still be uh, this universe that will remain absolutely unaffected, unmoved by the extinction of mankind. He goes on to state that the intellect cannot transcend itself. It, it has no mission to lead beyond human life. So straight off the bat, you get Nietzsche slicing your head off. Then he goes on uh, to state that the intellect operates out of protection to cheat man into believing that he has some important position in the universe. But of course, that is something he lacks. So we could say that we are worthless people, you, me and your grandma. We think we are important people, but honestly, it's just our minds playing games with us. In true honesty, we all suck equally. If we didn't exist, the world would still exist and it wouldn't be affected directly by our non-existence. But one thing remains true, I love you and you love me and we can be a big happy family. Nietzsche also has something to say in regards to how we are immersed in illusions and dreams. He says that man is immersed in illusions and dreams because their eyes look at things and they see the form of it. So if I flip this and show you another way to look at it, I would say that you look at things uh, and you think you know everything about it. But if we take an object like a cup, for example, we know that every cup is different, yet we treat all cups the same. We know what a cup is. We have this form of the perfect cup in our minds, but not all cups are the same as they are within our minds. We treat things as things in themselves. We attach the properties of certain things that have been blurred in our intuition to these objects. The reality of our minds is different to the reality of our external world, yet we allow the two to mix. Then Nietzsche moves on to define the invention of truth as a peace pact uh, that is created between people because they are social beings and that people set these codes so <laughs> and that people set these social conventions of truth or these rules you have to follow in order to give importance to the truth so that they can start interacting interacting with one another. So those people who follow these social conventions are those who that speak truthfully, while those who go against this social convention speaks a lie. So for example, I tell you that I have brown eyes when I actually have green eyes, which I do, ooh la la. Uh, so according to your social rules or this framework we have built for truth and lies, I'm telling a lie and I'm a jerk for it. And if I keep lying or if I do not follow your framework, then we will not be able to interact with peace. Nietzsche also claims that people do not run away from being cheated as much as from being damaged by um, deception and that they hate the bad, hostile consequences of certain kinds of deceptions. Oh man, uh, that has to hit hard. <laughs> Let me try and simplify, simplify this for you. In a simple sense, what Nietzsche is saying is that we don't run away from being cheated as much as we run away from the harmful consequences of being cheated. I mean, if you look at it, we like to cheat ourselves too. We get lost in thoughts. We think of better days. Some of us cheat on others, but we continue to do it as long as the consequences remain unknown. We watch movies and we become immersed in it and we begin to think we're, you know, Tyler Durden from Fight Club. <laughs> so we like to be cheated. Uh, we don't always run away from it, but we run away from the harmful things brought about from being cheated. 
Then Nietzsche also claims that language is lacking in truth because words are merely imperfect metaphors for a unique stimulus. Nietzsche suggests that there can be no universal objective truth and that language is too weak and imperfect to ever communicate the total truth. Let's say that, you know, I love you. Okay, I love you. But words are not enough to describe the love I have for you. I write poetry, I look for words in the dictionary and I say really cheesy things. But the words cannot explain the full essence of my love for you. In my mind, I have this sort of blurred out concept of love that perfectly, perfectly gets processed within my mind. But not in the external world. Language is lacking in truth. My love cannot be defined in this absolute perfect sense to you. So what is truth to Nietzsche? We will quote Nietzsche in a German voice to pay respect to Nietzsche. Not only because uh, there is a, not only that, but you know, there's a, a word in this quote that kind of makes me stumble over my words and I don't want to mess it up and make myself look like an idiot. <laughs> what then is truth? A mobile army of metaphors, metonyms and anthropomorphisms, in short, a son of human relations which have been enhanced, transposed and embellished poetically and rhetorically, and which after long use in firm, canonical, and obligatory to a people, truths are illusions about which one has forgotten that this is what they are, metaphors which are worn out and without sensuous power, coins which have lost their pictures and now matter only as metal, no longer as coins. Okay, when Nietzsche claims that truths are illusions about which one has forgotten, that this is what they are, metaphors which are worn out and without sensuous power, what he means is that we are the ones who assign the value designations to the language that we constantly use. We pretend language is self-evident and that there is an ontological link between reality and language. We simply assign words to things and treat them like they are actually what the words mean. But we have forgotten this fact. And we live with it. We unconsciously lie to ourselves about it. Thus, they become illusions about which we have forgotten about. Also, since there are many languages and reality looks different in different languages, and if each language captured reality, then either there is no single reality or each language does not fully capture reality. So in short, there is no true absolute reality. The world that appears to us is the only world and the true world is just a lie added on to it. Nietzsche also states that the drive towards the formation of metaphors is the fundamental human drive and that it has not been truly vanquished and that it had constructed this new realm and channel for its activity and that it finds this in myth and art generally. I assume what Nietzsche also means that since we do not need to name things as much as before, we still have this drive to create things, we still have this drive to create metaphors. Metaphors are obviously symbolic of something else. Many people kind of tie metaphors to language. They think the only limit to a metaphor is linked to language. But I could say something like the amounts of money being lost by the company were enough to make it a metaphor for an industry that was staggering. And you would know that metaphors are not only used for linguistic terms. So this drive for creativity, this drive to form metaphors have been converted into something else. And for us, that is making myths and ling uh, artistic forms of things. So one could say that the content on TikTok is just us driving our need to form metaphors, since the formation of metaphors is an essential human drive. M to the B, M to the B, and bop, boom, 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 blah. Another interesting claim that Nietzsche makes is that man has an invincible inclination to allow himself to be deceived, that man becomes enchanted with happiness when he is told epic fables as if they were true, or when the actor in the theatre acts more royally than any real king. But as long as he is deceived without injuring that master of deception, the intellect is free. It is released from its former slavery. So we like to be deceived, we like to be manipulated in some dark sense. As long as the deception is not harmful, we are cool with it. Well, um, most of us are. Most of us are cool with it, you know. Some of us, I think, go with it, you know. We don't even know that we're being manipulated. We have like this sort of uh, sense that we are being manipulated. We have some gut instinct, but we kind of like ignore it. Like it's not there. 
uh, comment below if you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> Nietzsche also talks about these two figures which are the rational and intuitive man. Nietzsche claims that the intuitive man is a source of creativity which allows the establishment of civilization. But at the same time, Nietzsche knows that the intuitive man is vulnerable to greater disappointment and frequent bouts of suffering. But despite this, the intuitive man will still experience more frequent and more greater joys than the rational man. If anyone understands intuition, you'd know that it plays some uh, role of joining patterns together. Oh God, I just burped. I'm so sorry. Do forgive me. Uh, you know, a lot of intuitive people uh, simply join things together that sort of tie up with the concept of confirmation bias, a prison of deception that talks to us. It tells us everything is coming together and everything's going to be okay. So intuitive people seem to be more optimistic than others too. So on one end, the intuitive has a lot of hope expectations. So when these hopes and expectations are not met, they become upset. And when there is a glimpse of something being possible, they light up with joy. The other things about intuitive people, I assume you guys can join up since you're a bunch of smarty pants yourselves. Hmm. Nietzsche claims that man, whether intuitive or rational, is dependent on concepts to which man clings needily his whole life to save himself. By stating that man clings needily to concepts, Nietzsche states that there is a certain level of universal, universal attachment to self-dissimulation, self-deception. This need is an inherent part of our nature. So long as we strive to save ourselves from suffering, uh, this need to save oneself from misery is fulfilled in different styles and those styles are those of the rational and intuitive man. Both of these people, these two figures that Nietzsche talks about, they both achieve their desires by engaging in self-deception or deceiving oneself, in other words. One deceives himself in joy and the other in misery. And even though there exists this denial of emotion, they fail to escape misery. They both cheat themselves at different points to get away from suffering. One is no better than the other and both are equal in both their accomplishments and sacrifices. Uh, so for the rational man, Nietzsche says if a dark storm cloud bursts upon him, he wraps himself up in his cloak and slowly walks out from under it. This shows how the rational man just accepts his suffering by masking it or in other words of Nietzsche, wrapping himself up in a cloak. He doesn't want any sense of freedom from misery, but he would deceive himself by accepting reality and at the same time he would ignore the misery he feels. He is still living and experiencing this misery, but he is disregarding it by appearance. Okay, so that pretty much sums up the whole essay. Jeez, man.